Good evening. We're so glad that you're joining us tonight for a Sunday evening Bible study. And uh, we're going to continue to study here in Mark chapter 7, where we left off last week. Um, but before we dig back into God's Word, uh, will you join me in prayer? And let's give this time of study to Him tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for what you did in our service this morning and being with us. And we ask that you continue to be with us tonight as we're meeting together in our homes but we are drawing from your word tonight, and so speak to us, um, and if someone's going through a difficult time, Lord, and as we dig into our study tonight about how you work in our lives, we just ask, Lord, that through this study, that you will speak to those that are watching and partaking into this time, um, and help us be able to be the arms and feet of you. We love you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight we're going to be in Mark chapter 7. So the last several weeks we've been doing a study through Mark. We started in Mark chapter 5. Uh, it's been almost probably two months ago now. And uh, we've been working our way through. Uh, last week we just started chapter 7. And this week we're going to be picking up where we left off in verse 24. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and get that ready um, in chapter 7 of Mark starting in verse 24. Um, and where we left off, we saw that Jesus was kind of being tried, so to speak, by the Jewish leaders, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, and, and they were asking him how come that, that his disciples and himself didn't wash their hands properly in the, the ways of the elders, all these laws that the scribes had put in place. And, and Jesus responded back to them, we saw last week, where he talked about that, that evil and the unclean things come out of a man's heart, not necessarily out of what we put in our mouths, because that stuff just passes through, but it comes out of our hearts. And we see that he really went into detail with the disciples when they were questioning him what happened in his response in kind of a private meeting after they left those Pharisees and, and the scribes there. And so we've been on this theme and this conversation on how Christ is interacting and talking to his disciples. Uh, we are seeing that this is written, the, the Gospel of Mark was written by John Mark as, as we believe that, that Peter had, had shared these um, experiences that he had with Mark as he wrote these things down. And uh, so we want to pick off here, pick up where we left off in verse 24. And what we're seeing is another time that Jesus goes away with his disciples. Um, we're going to see a miracle happen tonight, but we're going to see that how the lessons, more or less, the lessons that the disciples were learning while they were with these private scenarios and private times that they had with Jesus. So picking up Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 24, it says this, And from hence he arose and went unto the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into the house and would have no man known it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, and heard of him, and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, and a Syrophoenician by nation, and she brought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. And Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter lied upon the bed. So here we here, we have a very kind of unique story um, in a lot of ways. Um, this, first of all, as we're looking here in Mark chapter 7, this particular story is also found in, in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. So this has been mentioned twice in the Gospels. Uh, this is one mentioning of this story. And so when we kind of look at Matthew's account and Mark's, uh, we, we get a better understanding on what's happening here. Uh, both accounts are, are pretty pretty much the same, uh, but we can draw a little bit from both of them. But we're reading out of Mark tonight, and I'll refer to Matthew a little bit. In verse 24, we had read that it says, From thence he arose, and he went out into the borders of, of Tyre and Sidon. So what he's doing is he's leaving Israel. 
Uh, this is an area just north of Israel. It's up by the Mediterranean Sea. And Christ and his disciples, if, if you remember back when they were in the boat and they went out and before they fed the 5,000, they were trying to get away. They were trying to find a, a place of rest. And when they got to the area they were and they landed there on the shore, what happened? The multitudes had ran in front of them. And then we see that Christ taught them all day and did miracles. And then they fed the 5,000. After that, they tried to get away again. Remember, the disciples went out of the boat and Christ went up in the mountainside. And that night, a great storm came and Christ came down and walked upon the water and calmed the storm. And so every time they tried to get away, try to find just a, a little rest because of all the, the tiredness and all the hustle and bustle and everything going on in ministry that's going on in their life, that we see that, that Christ kind of finds himself in a situation that people are still seeking him out. And so what we see here is once again, Christ is trying to find a time of rest. Because we all know in life that when we are very busy in life, we need times of rest. Otherwise, it, it, we could be disheartened. Uh, we can get into a pattern in our life where we can be burnt out and we can't be as enthusiastic as we want to be. And so we really need to find a balance in the work that we do for the Lord or just in general in life. Everything that we do in a work or a home atmosphere, find a balance of rest and peace and, and uh, regeneration both physically and spiritually. And so this theme we have talked about in, in Mark chapter 6 and here in Mark chapter 7 uh, of Christ finding a way with his disciples to go find a time of rest and, and to be able to recharge. And so in verse 24 it says that they left Israel. And you can just imagine at this point that everywhere they go in Israel, they're drawing a crowd. You know, this is the Messiah. Now some were trying to understand and, and, and many are searching to realize, to find out if he is the Messiah, but Christ was the Messiah. And so he was drawing large crowds by his miracles, by his teachings, the things that he was doing. People wanted to be a part of that. They wanted to see him. They wanted to interact with him. And it was hard as he was getting later in his ministry, in his, I say fame, and I mean that just in the, in the aspect of he was being more well-known. People knew him because of the stories that was being spread of the healings and miracles that he was performed. That, that people began to flock when they heard that he was coming to the area or region or they saw him or his disciples. And so Christ took this opportunity that he left the region altogether. And, and you would think if he left the region, he left the, the, the region of the Jews, the, the, of Israel there, that there wasn't a lot of people that was going to know him. So he said he came there. Um, he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and to enter into a house and would have no man know it. And so he went there and he says, but he could not hide. He was there trying to hide. Him and the disciples was trying to go to a place where they could hide to get away, where no one would know them, and that he could just find a place of rest uh, to be recharged, to be re-energized. But why he's there, we find as we enter verse 25, that a woman comes to him. It says, verse 25, For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. And so here we see that he's in the house. He's kind of in hiding, so to speak, with the disciples. And he's trying to, to rest. And while he was there, a woman finds out who he is. More than likely that the stories had made their way around the region. And, and once he, she realized who he was, she had to go to him because we find out that her daughter was possessed with an unclean spirit. And what this means is that she had some, uh, um, some demon living inside of her, demonic spirit uh, that she was plagued with, that living inside of her. Um, and there was a spiritual issue uh, when you look at this, a spiritual issue that, that was happening in this woman's daughter. And so she was seeking out help. And in all scenarios, I kind of interject this, that whenever someone's seeking out help, they have went to the doctors, they have went to the professionals, they had went to whoever it can be, and they could not find the peace that they needed. They couldn't find the help that they needed. And they've come down to the end of the rope, and now they are going to Christ, seeking after him, because they're hearing stories, and they're understanding that Christ was able to make ways, and make chains drop off, and doors open, that no one else was able to do. 
And so this mother, hearing that he's in the area, hearing of knowing who he was, came and flocked to him because she is a loving mother seeking help for her daughter. Now, any of us that are parents or grandparents, even to the aspect of even being uncles or aunts, we would do anything we could for our family, let alone our children and the children in our family. We love them so much. We would go to the ends of the earth to help them. You know, a crying child who is sick, a, a child who is going through pain, a, a child who is going through times in their life is just heartbreaking for us, especially when we're their parent and, and we're kind of in charge. God has entrusted us to be able to provide and take care of them and to look after them. And so we can put ourselves in the shoes of a parent going through a situation that we would do anything we possibly could to be able to find rest and be help, be helpful for our child. And that's what we see here. As we go in, it says in, in verse 27, But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. Is it not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs? And so what she's saying here is that what she's reaching out to Christ here, that she is a Gentile. She's in an area that's not of the Israelites. And, and I kind of jumped over that a little bit. But not only do we know the area of Tyre and Sidon is of the Gentiles, of the non-Jews, um, but even Mark calls them out that she's a uh, Syrophesian, <laughs> if I pronounce that right, Syrophesian, meaning that she's from the area of Sidon. Uh, we know that. She's from that region. Um, that region was known... Um, boldly, uh, more so in the Bible, of the area where Jezebel came from in the Old Testament, if you remember the story of Jezebel. And so you can imagine what the Jews really thought of that area. Uh, kind of um, the worship of Baal came out of that region, and the worship that you saw in Israel of Baal all kind of stemmed from you know going back to that region in that area. And so the Jews didn't look really fondly upon the Gentiles, you know, the non-Jewish people, but strictly also to the area in this region. And so here she is, this Jewish, or this non-Jewish, this Gentile, this Greek woman up in this area, and she's come to Christ, and Christ responds to her that let the children be filled first, for it is not me for me to take the bread away from them to cast it to the dogs. Now what that means, that, that really sounds kind of strong statement. And if we just read through this and hear that for the first time, it really makes us paint Christ in a light of, what are you doing, Christ? You know, here we have a woman begging after you, seeking to find help for her daughter. We can all put ourselves in her shoes of seeking help, and you're just telling her no, let alone saying that, pretty much calling her a dog. And that is what the Jews would call um, the Gentiles. They refer to the Gentiles as dogs. Um, and I know that sounds harsh, but it was really harsh back then. The Jews did not... Uh, look very fondly on the Gentiles. We think of the Samaritans. Samaritans was kind of that mixed race of both, you know, some Jews and some uh, Gentiles over history, that mixed race. They didn't look fond of them, but they really did not look fond to the Gentiles as a whole, the non-Jews. And they called them dogs. Um, today, when we think of our pets and our dogs, um, oftentimes dogs are considered man's best friend. We consider them parts of the family. Um, but back then, dogs were ones of ones that were wild. They weren't really domesticated. Dogs would run in packs. They were nuisance animals. Um, they would get into trash and other things, uh, as you could imagine. Um, and they were not look highly upon um, of the type of animals. They were very nuisance in the way they were. They were very unclean. And so looking at them, that's what they compared the Gentiles. And you can imagine, <laughs> hearing Christ make this statement, let the children be filled first. It's not meant for us to take the food, the bread away from the children, and cast it to the dogs first. You normally give the dogs the leftovers. We can comprehend that today. You don't cook a meal and give the food to the, the, the dogs and then give the leftovers to the kids. You give the food to the kids and us and leftover goes to the dogs. We, we understand that. And that's what Christ is saying. But in a way, when he's saying this, he's comparing that Gentile woman, her daughter, the area of that region unto the dogs. And a Jewish reader, a Jewish person would understand that. Even the Gentiles would understand how the Jews felt about them and looked down upon them. And so this sounds, at first, when we read that, disheartening. 
Um, but as we know scripture, we see prophecy, we see the Old Testament, we see even what Christ is saying, is that he came to the Jews first. Uh, he was the Jewish Messiah. It was the Jews that, that was promised a Messiah, was promised a deliverer. But when Christ came, he came not only for the Jews, but he came for the Gentiles alike. He came to this earth to die for your sins and my sins and everyone, uh, as we talked about last week, just a little bit when we talked about what's going on in this world and, and, and the racism and everything, that he died for all mankind. Uh, red, yellow, black, and white. Uh, they are all precious in his sight, the song that we sang. The Jews and the Gentiles alike. Christ came to die for all mankind. But as he was here, walking and talking, he was coming to the Jews first giving them the opportunity to repent first, and then he went to the Gentiles. Even the disciples, we see this, they were first sent out to the Jews, and then they were sent out to the Gentiles. And so he was making this comparison. As he was getting away in this Gentile city to be able to relax and to be able to, to recharge, he was telling them that this time right now is for him to be able to minister and to speak and to teach and, and do miracles and mighty work to the Jews. The time for the Gentiles will come. And, and that's what he was more or less saying. You know, in a way it comes across harsh, but what he was saying, he's fulfilling prophecy. He's coming to the Jews. He's coming to the chosen ones. The Gentiles will have their time. It just wasn't yet. But it would happen, and we know it's already happened, that, that he has come to deliver all of us, all mankind. But verse 28, we see this mother has not given up. It says, And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And so what a response that she said. You know, the mother could have given up when she begged and begged and begged and didn't get an answer. Um, when we look at, and I kind of mentioned this, the story was in the Gospel of Matthew. When we read Matthew's account, Matthew kind of goes and says that she begged and begged and begged continually until he finally answered. And so you can imagine, here she is begging with no answer, just silence. And then she begged a little more, no answer, and just silence. And after a period of time had passed, Christ finally answered her. And in this answer was that he'd come to the Jews first, and then he'll eventually come to the Gentiles. And so that wasn't good enough for her. And you see her response. Her response is, yes, Lord, I understand. That makes total sense to me. She didn't get worked up. She didn't get upset. She said, I, I understand that. Yes, Lord, that makes total sense. But, Lord, in your comparison analogy that you're using, that even the dogs under the tables, they eat of the crumbs that fall from the master's table, from the children's table. And when I hear that, I think about the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember the rich man, and he had an overabundance of supply. And here was Lazarus outside the gate, and, and he wasn't even able to eat or barely able to eat of the crumbs that fell from the master's table. Because where did the crumbs go? They went to the dogs. So the dogs were being better well fed than the poor man that was begging outside Lazarus outside the rich man's gate. And so I think about that in this scenario, that, that she is telling Christ, that even the dogs eat crumbs. Even the dogs are eating crumbs from the table. Um, any of us that have dogs, especially any of us that have children and dogs, we can relate. Um, Rochelle and I, with Gavin and Gracie, uh, the dogs know what child is the messiest. Um, in our house, uh, Gracie is very sweet and uh, she's very pretty, but she uh, she's younger than Gavin. and she, Gavin is very clean in particular when he eats. And uh, Gracie, a lot of times... Uh, her focus is just getting the food in the mouth, and some of us can relate to that. And, and during that, the eating time that we have, um, there is typically plenty of crumbs that fall on the table, on the chairs, on the floor, and everything around. And the dogs know that. Our dogs, we have three of them, actually, and our dogs are typically all the way around Gracie's chair waiting to be fed <laughs> by the crumbs. And so this lady is saying, hey, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the mas from the master or the the." The, the table that the children are eating from. And so Christ responds to this. What an answer that she had. What faith that she has to continue to be able to beg. In verse 29 it says, And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was coming to her house, she found the devil gone out of her daughter and lied upon the bed. And so you can just imagine this scenario that, that Christ says, Because of your faith, because of the love that you have for your child, that, 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 that you honored me and knew what I was saying and understood, and because of your faith to continue to rely on me, 
I have healed your daughter this very hour. And I could just imagine, we said she, she come to the house and found that she she had been healed, that she just laid on the table. You can imagine, uh, laid on the table is probably an understatement. I can just imagine, uh, have you ever been through something and you're all worked up, you can't sleep, and, and, and you're just beside yourself, and finally you realize there's peace, the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that Christ offers, the peace that calms the waves and the storms that we go through in life, and we just experience this sweet peace of rest. It's just almost like collapsing that Christ has delivered and performed a miracle in our life. And that is what has happened here in this young, war, this young woman and her mother's life, that Christ had provided this peace and this understanding. A couple things that I want to point to, and I'll draw this to a close tonight. Number one, the first thing I want to draw to is the fact that, that this mother, this woman, continued to go, and there was a period of time that Christ you know, just stood in silence. We see this more in Matthew than we do in Mark, but we see that she continued to beg, and he, she wasn't getting the answer up front that she wanted. And there was a period of silence, or there was a period of waiting that she had until Christ finally delivered her from what she was asking. A lot of times in our life, when we go to God, and we go to God through Christ, our Advocate, and we beg for him to help us, to heal us, to help someone in our family, to help us through the situation we're going through. God works in his own timing. And sometimes we have a hard time to deal with the silence. Sometimes we have a hard time of dealing with what we're going through. And so I believe that looking at this story, this is speaking to us to not to give up hope, that, that through our silence, that God is speaking to us. God is hearing us. God hears us if, if we are saved and we're going to God through Christ, His Son, and we're asking Him to help us. God hears us. The Holy Spirit our comforts there to comfort us. He knows what we're going through, but the answer is not always in our timing. The answer is not always how we expect it to be. But no one understand that the Lord hears us. He hears our cry. He heard the disciples a couple weeks ago when we talked about them being entrapped on the boat in the storm that they were going through. He heard them where he was up on the mountain and he came to deliver them. Things may be tough. Things may go through and uh, uh, not in the timing that we have. But understand and know today that God hears you. God hears me when we go to him in prayer and that he works out all things in his timing. The second thing that I want to, to, to speak to here, and I'll draw this to a close, is the fact that when we look at this, if we just look at very briefly, we could say, man, Christ wasn't very friendly in this aspect. Here we have a mother crying out on behalf of her daughter, and she wasn't hearing him, or hearing her. She, she wasn't responding. And, and in his response was pretty much, you know, go away. And we can understand if the person was, let's say the woman at the well, and, and, and she, she was sinful. She, she had many husbands, and the one she had, she was, the guy she was with now wasn't even her husband. She was called an adultery and all this other stuff. You could see, and being bound in sin and all this other, and we know this was a Gentile, but being bound in sin, we can make, understand why maybe Christ didn't answer or answer right now. But here's a mother pleading for her child, and... We could think that, man, all the boxes are checked, so to speak, that she's, she's doing, she's pleading, she knows who Jesus is, she, she, she's coming to him, that, that why hasn't Jesus answered? And in our times of silence, a lot of times we question, what is going on? What, what is Jesus or what is God thinking? What is he trying to, to send to us? And, and I don't think any of us can answer that. I can't answer that. Um, every situation is unique in what God is working through. But I think what we see in this story, and a lot of times I've seen in my life and seen in others, during this times of silence, sometimes God is working with us to grow our faith. He hasn't left us helpless. He's still there with us. The Holy Spirit is, lives within us. His glory is still shining through. His grace is sufficient. He is still working in our lives. But because there's a time in silence, because we're in a waiting period, so to speak, our faith begins to grow. I think about Job and all the things that went through Job. We talked about that many weeks ago when this coronavirus stopped, started. We, we mentioned Job and, and what he had to go through. I think about Job and, and all the things he went through and he prayed out to the Lord. It took some time to eventually 
God restored Job's help. God, or God re restored Job's help, and he restored his family. And to a point, you know, he couldn't bring back those that died, but he restored him more so than he had before. He restored his wealth more so than he had before. All these things, but there was there was a time, and through this, we saw even how stronger Job's faith was because of it. If anything that we see from this story is that this woman's faith is what saved her that day. This woman's faith is what saved her daughter. And through our times of silence that we have with God, a lot of times it's growing our faith. And we can't answer what God is, is doing in those moments. Uh, we may not know on this side of heaven or ever know um, what his plan is. But I believe during these times our faith begins to grow stronger. We become more reliant on him, less relying on us, and it's the time that we really have to show that. It's easier for us to step back and say, we rely fully on God. But it's another thing to go through a situation where we have no choice but to rely on God and to just wait on God. And on the outside of that, when God comes through, we look behind what we went through and what we experienced. And we realize that our faith grew through all of that. And so if you're going through something today, maybe you've been crying out to God, maybe you're going through a waiting period, maybe you're going through a storm in your life. The coronavirus has a lot of things that's going on right now that's heartbreaking. Uh, the riots and, and the racism and everything that's going on that's in the forefront right now that we're talking about that needs to be there in our conversations is disheartening. And a lot of this that we're going through, uh, it may be disheartening to go through a waiting period. It may be disheartening to go through a time that we're crying out to God and not seeing immediately answers. Know that God hears you today. Know that God's timing is always perfect. And know that on the tail end of whatever we experience and go through today, if we fully trust in Him, that our faith will grow deeper and stronger, our belief will grow stronger in Him. Um, here on the screen, I, I put my number and my email. If you would like um, prayer, if there's something I can pray for you personally, uh, if you would like to have a conversation with me about something you're going through in life, um, if you have not asked Christ into your heart and you don't know what that means, we would love for you to be able to reach out to me and us here at the church. And I'd love to be able to share what it means to have and experience the saving grace of Jesus Christ in your life. Um, but at this time, we're going to close in prayer. We thank you for joining us tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you tonight. We just ask that you be with those that was with us or, or even those that are not able in our church that not have internet or watch, that you pour out a blessing on them. Speak into hearts and lives. You know the ones of us that are watching tonight. That may be battling some, some deep pains in our life. That's in a waiting period. Uh, be able to speak into their hearts today. This very hour to know that you hear their prayers. You hear their cries. And that you will work everything out in your timing. We have that faith and belief. Ha may you encourage in us. Speak to us through your spirit. To know that you are continuing fighting our battles and working our behalf. Because we know that by scripture and by faith that you are working out wonders in our life. We thank you today, Lord. We put all of these things in your hands. Uh, we seek after you for guidance in life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for joining us. We invite you to be back with us, if able, for our service inside the building next Sunday at 1030. If you're able to join us, um, if not, join us online. And then, of course, uh, we'll continue to have these online Bible studies at Sunday night at 5 p.m. So we hope that you're taking something out of these uh, the studies. Uh, these scriptures, I know we only looked at a few verses tonight, um, but there's a lot that we can take out of just some short verses in the Bible. Um, so we love you tonight. We're praying for you. We hope you have an awesome week to come. Um, we're so excited to see you again next week, Lord willing. Thanks a lot. Have a good evening.